have Joe Wyatt, and he is going to speak on a very interesting subject. He's not here yet. I wait patiently, but he's going to be talking about an article he wrote uh, on, on B.F. Skinner, and it is Behavior Science and the Crosshairs, the FBI file on B.F. Skinner. This is in Behavior and Social Issues uh, in the year 2000. Behavioral science and its practitioners have come under government scrutiny for a variety of reasons, such as when politicians take issue with grant funding or when a leading behavioral scientist puts forth controversial ideas or becomes actively involved in social concerns. One such case was that of B.F. Skinner. The FBI file on B.F. Skinner was obtained under the Freedom of Information Act. I assume you know who B.F. Skinner was. Skinner was aware that the FBI monitors activities. The file reveals extensive checking on Skinner's contacts with a Chinese scientist and on his protest against nuclear testing in the Vietnam War. He had lent his name to newspaper uh, protests, advertisements that were signed by dozens of scientists. Both the government's Cold War anti-communist sentiment and the esteem in which Skinner was held by colleagues are reflected in the heavily censored pages contained within the file. And uh, I think uh, I think Joe is here. Jeez. Ladies and gentlemen, we're back here with Dr. Joe Wyatt, who has been, uh, we could almost call him a frequent guest here at Criminal Behaviorology, maybe the most frequent guest we have because this is, uh, I think, the third outing here, and he's decided to show up two days after his 75th birthday. Is that correct. right? That's correct. Yeah. Three quarters of a century then. Right. Yeah. So, okay. Long, long time. Well, great. Great to hear it. I've gone quite a bit of why, uh, years wise myself lately. So, okay, uh, and we have here, uh, I think this is a very interesting topic uh, from behavior and social issues in the year 2000, behavioral science in the crosshairs, the FBI file on B.F. Skinner uh, by uh, W. Joseph Wyatt. So, uh, I went over just briefly the abstract of it. Can you can you kind of give us a summary? I, I'm assuming everybody knows uh, B.F. Skinner operant conditioning. Uh, you should probably familiarize yourself with that. But this uh, article, although it was written in 2000, I find it a little bit timely for today's events, FBI activity, and so forth. What inspired you to write an article like this, Joe? Uh, you know, Tim. Thank you. Um... With a nice introduction, I uh, was aware that the FBI had a file on B.F. Skinner, who passed away in about 1990. Um, and I knew this because Skinner knew it. And in his three part autobiography, he talked about it. Uh, he was somewhat surprised, a little chagrined that the FBI was watching him. And uh, so. In um, late 1991, I wrote to the FBI and requested a copy of their file on B.F. Skinner. And two and a half years later, I got it. So, you know, they do not move real quickly. Was this, uh, was this request through the Freedom of Information Act? Yes, exactly. Which has turned out to be a pretty valuable tool to get things like that. I can't it's remember when the, the FOIA, I, when I worked uh, for attorneys, we did some FOIA requests, but it's, it's like there's certain documents, that's the only way you're going to get it. Yep. Um, and I, I thought at the time, and as you mentioned, I think it's just as relevant now to uh, see what the FBI is doing. Of course, there's controversy right now over the FBI's 
uh, getting the uh, recovering the classified files from uh, Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago home. And um, I think we're having new information every day almost right right now about that. And I find that quite interesting. But um, B.F. Skinner, of course, known as, uh, he's certainly not thought of as the father of behaviorism, but he is clearly its most visible exponent. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, it has been a number of years now that he is cited more often than any other behavioral scientist uh, historically overall in the, the cumulative citations in the literature. And he's even cited more than Sigmund Freud. Right. And uh, so he's an important person in behavioral sciences. I don't think there's anybody more important. So I knew that the file existed. I got hold of it and went through it and found some of it very interesting and somewhat timely because it showed the skepticism. It revealed a lot of skepticism and actually attacks on behavioral science and behavioral scientists that arose from political sources. And we probably should not be surprised. It still goes on today. If you think about the political attacks on the science of climate change, for example, the political attacks on uh, COVID and how it's best dealt with and uh, what treatment is best and should we mm -hmm. wear masks and all kinds of things like that. Think about the attacks from political sources uh, on teaching of evolution versus mm -hmm. creation science and on and on it goes and this just never stops. So I guess there's no reason to think that behavioral science should have been any different. So, is that is that why uh, it, is that a possibility? Because it wasn't clear on what the motive was for pursuing B.F. Skinner, um, but just his ideology, or that some people were uncomfortable, or maybe uh, feared the potential power of behavioral science. I think that was certainly part of it, and I'll get to that actually in a little bit. But he was criticized by directly by members of Congress and the vice president uh, mm -hmm. under Richard Nixon, Spiro Agnew. And I'll mm -hmm. talk a little more about that as we go along. But it began in the 19, late 1950s because Skinner was so well known by then. World, he was a worldwide figure already. Mm -hmm. And he was having some communication with uh, colleagues in China. And the FBI, if you remember the 1950s and even the 60s, and to some extent later, they were all about uh, communism and red China, they called uh -huh. it. Even in some of the details of Skinner's, uh, the, their investigations of Skinner, they referred to red China. And yeah, so, so th that's this that is evidently like post the Chinese cultural re communist revolution in China. That's Chairman why it's Mao now, and all that. Chairman Mao, now it's red China. Yeah. And uh, they were concerned about a, a large, most populous country now being a communist regime. That's correct. Um, and uh, so Skinner was corresponding with uh, someone in China, a, a faculty member at Peking University, that would be called Beijing University now, I suppose, mm -hmm. with the name change, and uh, sending him books and trading journal articles, just routine things mm -hmm. that we've all probably done, not necessarily with China, but it's just done. And um, so that got them a little bit interested in B.F. Skinner, but nothing really came of that. Mm -hmm. um, later, a year later in 1960, something very interesting happened. There is a very famous Nobel Prize winning chemist, Dr. Linus Pauling, who was also well known for his uh, anti-nuclear activism. And a committee in the Congress was investigating Dr. Linus Pauling 
who, by the way, is one of only four people to win the Nobel Prize twice. And he's the only person to have won it twice individually without, that is, as opposed to being members of a team that they all won it. So, uh, you know, he was, his research was in chemistry and things that I don't really understand all of it. But uh, he had come under scrutiny of a committee in the Senate that doesn't even exist anymore, whose goal in life was to kind of see if anybody out there was doing things that that were un-American. And so mm -hmm. uh, many, many scientists, including behavioral scientists, including B.F. Skinner, uh, gave support to a full page ad in the New York Times saying, hey, let's lay off of Dr. Linus Pauling. That's all he had done. He just exercised his right to free expression. And that triggered uh, an FBI investigation, believe it or not. <laughs> we may sometimes think nowadays that couldn't happen, but I think it certainly could. So that was in 1960. And that more or less blew over. And um, but a year later, the FBI was back at it. Um, and they were still looking at Linus Pauling and anybody like Skinner that had been supportive of him. And at that point, the director of the FBI, its only director up to that point, J. Edgar Hoover, uh -huh. founding director, who was its director for about 50 years up till his death uh -huh. in 72, uh, he got a request from the White House to do this again is in 61. So the president would have been John F. Kennedy requesting a background check on Skinner. Now it wasn't mm -hmm. really clear why the White House wanted this. Were they going to honor him? Were they going to, uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. you know, maybe assign him to some important government work? Who knows? Um, and in any case, this request had come through. It's also possible, not to be too much of a conspiracy theorist, that they just wanted to investigate Skinner further. And uh, to do that, they contrived a White House request for an investigation. Okay. But in any event, um, they went back into Skinner's history. This was the most extensive investigation of Skinner. Mm -hmm. They went back to if anybody recalling his history, he was raised in Pennsylvania. And uh, after graduating from college, uh, he spent a year almost back at his parents' home working on a book about the coal industry, of all things. Uh, his father was a coal industry lawyer. Mm -hmm. He was uh, working on that project. But then he went to New York City to try to become a novel writer, and that bombed. But okay. the FBI, by 1961, which is decades later, uh, they went to New York City to the police department. They investigated the apartment that Skinner had lived in for about a year and his neighbors there and the building supervisor and the elevator operator. I mean, can you okay. imagine decades later trying to scratch their heads and say, B.F. Skinner, I don't know. You know? Yeah. <laughs> we have Some a lot of them of had, had very weak memories. I don't really remember anything about him other than uh, I know he made it big. So that, that was about it. That's all they had to offer. Yeah. One of, well, actually, uh, they went back to Hamilton College where he'd gone to college and they interviewed people there, including a professor who said, I don't know anymore about what's up with him, but, you know, I heard he did pretty well. <laughs> so, um, very, very interesting. They went to the schools where he had taught. You know, he taught at Indiana University and the University of Minnesota, and they interviewed people there who did remember him, certainly. And they all said, well, this was a pretty good guy and a very accomplished researcher and nothing negative about his uh, patriotism and all that. Uh, they went to neighbors and uh, police departments in all these places and interviewed people. They even went to Vermont where he vacationed and the police said, oh, we don't have any arrest records up here. Um, they went it to does the sound, it does sound like more than just 
uh, an assessment to see should he have a government. I'm not sure about that, but the, more yeah. than just a, a government post, it sounds like they were really digging. It seemed like a lot of man hours or something like that. And they went to the Air Force. Um, mm -hmm. And as we were talking a little informally before we began this uh, interview, Skinner had um, done research and, and he called the publication, if I remember right, A Pigeon and a Pelican. And he had trained, using operant conditioning, trained pigeons to uh, sit in the nose cone of a nuclear, not nuclear, but a, an intercontinental missile or a intracontinental missile. And they could peck at a screen and guide the missile to uh, go in and bomb a tank or a building or whatever. And Skinner had showed that that could work. Now, it was never put into practice. Of course, uh -huh. we got into the Cold War, but that had been done. And of course, though, by the time of this 1961 uh, investigation of Skinner by the FBI, the Cold War was, you know, in high gear. Uh, World so, War II yeah. had been over for years, you know. So. It would have been uh, the first guided missile then, guided missile technology. At least by a pigeon, it would have been the first yeah. and only, that's yeah. for sure. Yeah. Uh, so they went to, the FBI agents went to the New York City Public Library to see if there was anything about Skinner there, and they found books he'd written. <laughs> by that point, he had authored several books. Uh, so, you know, this, this was kind of being, this was taken seriously. Uh -huh. And at about the same time, something that maybe ratcheted up the concern even more was that Skinner, along with a bunch of other scientists, went to Russia. Talk about fear of communism. Okay. So, um, this was in the Soviet Union days, of course. And they were just going there to, you know, visit laboratories and, of course, Russia's where the Pavlov's labs were and so on. Not still operating. Pavlov, of course, was gone by then, but they were still doing research over there. And uh, so they just kept updating their findings throughout uh, 1961. And... Um, I found it interesting among the Harvard University professors that they interviewed, uh, one who they didn't name described Skinner as a brilliant scientist, loyal, reliable, of excellent character. Another said that uh, Harvard psychology faculty member said that he just, I'll just read from it. He had been acquainted with Skinner since 1931, had never had any reason to question his character. Now, who does that person sound like? It's not named, but. Kind of sounds like Fred Keller, uh -huh. lifelong friend and uh, Harvard associate. So, Joe, uh, I just I just now thought of this. Uh, I don't mean to interrupt, but uh, on that trip to Russia, you're probably familiar with the movie The Manchurian Candidate. I am, uh, and that was that was like in the '60s, wasn't it? The yes, first version there's a, of it. a more recent version, which I haven't seen yet, but in the '60s. Yes, uh, that was the case of uh, a GI who had been captured. Actually, I think it was in uh, uh, Korea, North Korea, yeah. Yeah. and he had been brainwashed there to be a sort of human time bomb. Right, it was played by Frank Sinatra of all people, and yeah. he came back to the U.S. and he seemed normal, but the they had programmed him to be under the control of a person they called the Red Queen, uh -huh. played of all people by Angela Lansbury. An Angela Lansbury, and, yeah. And uh, of Murder, She Wrote, is that? Yeah, she, yeah, that's her, yeah. And um, a great actress still with us. And uh, so she could trigger him. She yeah. was in the States, and she could trigger him to go off and do some kind of great destruction. Yeah, like an assassin, become an assassin, assassin of a presidential candidate or something. Yeah. Some kind of stuff like that. So I don't know if they saw that movie and thought, wow, gee, could this really happen? And Maybe. Uh, yeah, because <laughs> I, I, in the movie, I remember uh, that they were transferred to 
They said it was the Pavlovian society in the Soviet Union for their conditioning or, or, or whatever. I mean, yeah. that's, that's what I thought about when you mentioned all yeah. that. So that maybe that was that was inspiring for them. I don't maybe know. Uh, they, Skinner was showing them how to program people to come back to the U.S. Maybe he was going to come to the U.S. And uh, I don't know. I don't know how they would have thought he would have done any damage, but it, yeah, it, it was a that's a great movie. Mm -hmm. People may enjoy it, but it's kind of far fetched, I think. Yes. Um. So they continued this investigation, and um, they found that the trip to Russia was sponsored by the Ford Foundation and the National Academy of Sciences. Not exactly hardcore communist enterprises. You know? uh -huh. And uh, so finally, um, J. Edgar Hoover wrote back to the White House in June of 61 saying, well, we've done this extensive investigation and we couldn't find anything really awful, but we did find a lot about B.F. Skinner that was quite positive. So um, that was to a large extent, that ended the big investigation of 61. Uh, there were a couple of others, however, and we can go into those if you like. Sure, sure. Yeah, I kind of noticed it continued after that, and it just made me wonder why. I mean, it was several investigations, and I don't know if they were all for the same reason or maybe different reasons that they were doing it. Well, in 63, August of 63, Skinner announced that he was going to make a trip to China. Okay. And that is Red China, as they referred to it in the uh, FBI file. Mm -hmm. And if he did, what was he up to? Well, nothing much except academic stuff that would bore FBI agents to tears, probably. So that investigation was quickly closed and nothing to show for it, except no negatives about Skinner. Mm -hmm. Then we move ahead five years to 1968. Now, by that time, the Vietnam War was going on hot mm -hmm. and heavy. Mm -hmm. And um, again, the FBI opened an investigation, allegedly because the White House had requested it. Uh, by this time, this would have been May of 68. So the um, the president, let's see, would have been still Gerald Ford? No, 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 no. Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson, yeah. He decided not to run again, but the campaign was on. I think I'm right on my dates. And, of course, Nixon was elected president. Mm -hmm. But in any event, uh, another request from the White House. This one seems even more suspicious because once again it may have started because skinner uh, and several hundred if i recall correctly other scientists including other behavioral scientists had used their names in an ad uh, that appeared in the cambridge uh, massachusetts newspaper but it was essentially the same kind of ad that had appeared in the New York Times as being in opposition to the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. now, it wasn't exactly big news that someone would be against the Vietnam War uh, since by the time it went another two, three years, essentially the whole country was against it. Um, and, a lot in uh, the, a lot in the academic uh, it was strong uh, resistance to it and like the a lot of in the academics the big major universities there was a lot of like correct. pushback by that time against Vietnam correct um, and you know people were asking themselves why should I young men because we still had a draft at that time young mm -hmm. men asking should I go throw my life away maybe for this war that we probably shouldn't have got into in the first place? And, you know, so campuses were shut down because of student disruption. And uh, mm -hmm. so, you know, it was, it was a very, very difficult time. Um, so it's not clear, was the White House really looking for some reason to find out more about 
B.F. Skinner for some kind of assignment or award or who knows what, or was it that a pretext to investigate somebody who had put their name in an ad against the Vietnam War? Um, now, to show you, and of course, the, the Vietnam War was all about stopping communism. The, uh, the idea behind the Vietnam War was called the domino theory of communism. For those who don't know, the idea was if North Vietnam fell to communism, then other nearby countries, one after another, like a row of dominoes, would also fall mm -hmm. to communism. Mm -hmm. Now that turned out to be wrong, mm -hmm. completely wrong. Uh, but it was a selling point for the war, and uh, that's how we got into it. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, it's kind of the inverse of the Iraq War that began in March of 2003, in which we invaded under the idea of the, the domino theory of democracy, which also didn't work. You know, we would turn Iraq into a democratic nation like that's, the U.S. That's <laughs> true. We like, would be starting the dominoes and then the case. dominoes would fall. The other nearby countries would quickly become democratic. And that didn't okay. work either. Works both but, ways, I guess. But yeah, okay. aside, yeah, or it doesn't work both ways. Is <laughs> yeah, way yeah, yeah. So, to, but to show you the amount of this red scare business about communism, J. Edgar Hoover's FBI had 400 agents in New York City investigating communism. Mm -hmm. and they only had four investigating organized crime, which was a much more robust threat, <laughs> put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Now, there, there may be other reasons that J. Edgar Hoover wanted to emphasize communism as a big threat as opposed to organized crime. And a fellow named Anthony Summers authored a 1993 book about J. Edgar Hoover. And in that book, he speculated that Hoover, as director of the FBI, who was a closeted gay person uh, in an era where it was dangerous to be out of the closet, still somewhat dangerous, of course, and, um, and that the, the mob the mafia had the goods on him, mm -hmm. video, different kinds of things that they would expose him if he cracked down on organized crime. And, and that, that was like for the mafia, that was known to be one of their most powerful tools on politicians was blackmail. Exactly. Like catching them with prostitutes, catching them with gambling debts, uh, and then with perhaps with Hoover with other things. So, yeah. Yeah, they would... Um, they would kind of take care of each other. Hoover mm -hmm. would take care of the mafia. They would take care of him without having to just put a gun to his head. Mm -hmm. And to quote a little bit from the Anthony Summers book, he says, uh, in 1990, if I'm, I'm reading directly here, at age 80, New York mob boss Carmine Lombardozzi said that mafia chief Frank Costello and Edgar, uh, J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI had contact on many occasions and over a long period. Hoover was very friendly toward the families, the mob families. They took care of him, especially at the races. In other words, fixing races so he could win. Mm -hmm. And they had an understanding. He would lay off of them and they would turn a blind eye. Uh, he would turn a blind eye to them and they would provide him with payoff. Mm -hmm. Another mafia boss, uh, Anthony Summers goes on, Joe Banana, called Joe Bananas, mm -hmm. um, articulated the principles of the game. It was a strict underworld rule, he said, never to use violent means against a law enforcement officer. And of course, particularly not about against the head of the FBI. Mm -hmm. uh, ways could be found, he said in his memoirs, so that he, J. Edgar Hoover, would not interfere with us and we wouldn't interfere with him. 
-hmm. And the way the mafia found to deal with Edgar, according to several mob sources, involves his homosexuality. Um, so Hoover died in 1972, and he, he his body laid in state, um, like a like a president you in know, the he was rotunda. So yeah, yeah, he was so revered. And you know, it was said that he controlled a lot of politicians by mm -hmm. having his agents collect compromising information, their affairs, their drug use, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then he would mm -hmm. call them up and he'd say, well, let's have a meeting, come over to the FBI. And the politician would go over there and Hoover would show him the file and say, no, we've learned this about you, but believe me, we're gonna keep this all under wraps. Mm -hmm. and it would really be a shame if you, if any of this would fall into the wrong hands. So we're gonna keep it yeah. under wraps and oh, by the way, that legislation that to build a new FBI office building, where, how's that coming? And, you know, the message was sent. <laughs> so that was Hoover's method. Mm -hmm. um, so it sort of uh, brings us to the end of an era. I don't, I'm not aware of anything beyond a 1975 brief additional look at B.F. Skinner by the FBI, um, mm -hmm. evidently a request from the White House again, if we can believe that, and there was a one-page memo written saying, um, harking back to 1966, an official advised that the Pavlovian Society held a meeting in February of 66 at Harvard, and it was composed of uh, students who were friendly toward the teachings of noted Soviet uh, psychologist, actually physiologist, mm -hmm. Ivan Pavlov, who was yeah. famous for his experiments on uh, conditioned reflexes in animals. That went on also, to and Skinner also, also a Nobel Prize winner himself, Ivan Pavlov. Absolutely. Yeah. And Skinner should have had it, actually, I think, for mm -hmm. behavioral science, if they would give one for behavioral science. Then it said uh, Skinner hosted the meeting, which made sense being held at Harvard. <clears throat> but there was nothing else reported except it mentioned B.F. Skinner was the host. And he is relatively famous for, among other things, his experiments in which he taught pigeons to play ping pong. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Kind of sad that that's all they got out of it. After so, reviewing all those books, and that's what they had to. Yeah. Add, so. Well, they they should have had an agent who was a psych major, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so we get to sort of the end of the story, um, and I think some questions arise from all of this, mm -hmm. like, was there any? legitimate reason to ever have investigated B.F. Skinner? My opinion, there was not. Mm -hmm. And did any good come from their investigation? Not really, unless you want to say it was a complete, um, not exoneration, but a complete uh, kind of tribute to Skinner. All mm -hmm. the people saying what a great person he was. Mm -hmm. And when you think about it, going back 35 years to interview neighbors of his family when he was growing up, who could yeah. scarcely remember anything about the family. I mean, his parents had long been dead and he'd been gone for all those years. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Another question I have, was there ever an actual consideration for a presidential appointment? I don't know. I don't suppose we'll ever know. Um, and perhaps uh, that that by the so by the time nineteen seventy five rolled around, times had changed. That so that ultimately the Vietnam War ended. Um, that the anti communist, although Reagan would would kind of continue have his own phase of that, but the anti communist era of the sixties maybe had slowed down, and then B, and J Edgar Hoover had passed on. Mm -hmm. So those elements weren't there anymore. Um, that that makes me think Correct. it was really a, a very anti-communist kind of agenda is what was the B.F. Skinner investigations were about. And by the way, 
it might interest people to take a look. I'll show you a couple of pages on the file. Uh -huh. and you can see that much of it was redacted. I don't know if you can. Yeah, that's that. very, it's very, yeah. I see the confidential and uh, BF Skinner and they got all kinds of, all kinds of black ink on there. Yep, they do. There's, so that's from, uh, I'll take a look. That is from 1959. And you can see it wasn't much different. This is from 1963. All right. It's kind of, yeah. It just, yeah. You see them and, and pull it back just a little bit. It, yeah. You see all the huge black marks on it. And, yeah. Peking, China. So, yeah. Can't make anything out of that, really. It's so much no. blacked out. And this, I think, is another page, possibly from the same one. And most, yeah. I think, most most of what is blacked out is uh, our names. Okay, that one's a little better now. Yeah. yeah, it's a slightly better, but the whole thing is like that. Uh huh. For the speed yeah. readers, they can go through that or yeah, <laughs> yeah. go back. Yeah. So uh, that's that's what it's like. Uh, you know, another question I have, maybe the bigger question, when any citizen, but for us, a behavioral scientist is investigated by the government, what should be the response of the behavioral sciences community? Mm -hmm. First of all, you have to know that it's happened. And, um, I don't know. You know, it's it's a tricky question. Um, but you know, that's food for thought. Yeah, in this day and age, it's probably people in behavioral science or any of the academics uh, areas anywhere in academia. If there is investigations going on, there's probably ways now that they can inform the public or the public can inform them. Yes, it's being in, in, well. The FBI back in those days, they could you know much more secretive operation. Uh, but I think nowadays, uh, modern uh, social media and things could inform us when this is going on. And then a per the person might, you know, maybe should have the right to say, hey, why am I being investigated? What is this about? You know, of course. You know. And, you know, if, if someone came to me in my office, my university office, um, and said, we're with the FBI and we're investigating so and so that I had worked with or knew in some capacity. I probably would tell people about it, especially the guy being investigated or the woman being yeah. investigated. I would say, by the way, have you heard? Um, is there something about you that I should we should not have lunch <laughs> anymore? I don't know here. Yeah. Um, you know, earlier uh, tonight, um, I mentioned some of the political attacks on Skinner, and I'd like to share a couple of those just to mm -hmm. show you how how intimidating it can possibly be. Um, Skinner wrote a book called Beyond Freedom and Dignity. I think it was published in 71, uh -huh. if I recall correctly. And it was controversial because he had written the book not in academic style, but in style readable by innocent men, women, and children. Mm -hmm. And... Um, it was the first book I ever read from Skinner. Was exactly. Beyond Freedom and Dignity. Yeah. And so he, he was setting out his ideas about the philosophy of behaviorism more than anything else. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was, I think he had wanted to call it freedom and dignity, but his publisher insisted on putting the word beyond at the head yeah. of that. Yeah. And but anyway, he was attacked by a congressman from a forgotten what state named Gallagher, Cornelius Gallagher, mm -hmm. who got up on the floor of Congress and said this, I'm quoting, shortly after, oh, I'm sorry, um, I'm quoting from Skinner's autobiography about this congressman. Skinner wrote, shortly after the publication of Beyond Freedom and Dignity, I had an answer as to whether the gov he was talking about whether the government might start withholding grant funds from people like him. Mm -hmm. He said, I had my answer. 
Congressman Cornelius Gallagher, speaking on the floor of the House, questioned the propriety of my NIMH career award. Okay. Should the government subsidize a person who is, quote, advancing ideas which threaten the future of our system of government by denigrating the American traditions of individualism, human dignity, and self-reliance? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Gallagher asked. He was proposing that Congress create a committee on privacy, human values, and democratic institutions. Now, that could be, you know, that is not what we need. Um, so, Skinner goes on. The committee, Gallagher said, would be, quote, designed to deal specifically with the type of threats to our Congress and our constituents, which are contained in the thoughts of B.F. Skinner, unquote. Hmm. Skinner, a person who hmm. can be credited with revolutionizing uh, teaching practices and many other things. Uh, some of his background experience, experiments on uh, dealing with psychotic patients um, mm -hmm. in Massachusetts, in hospitals, using reinforcement and all of that. Uh, so Skinner goes on to say, um, another vocal or another vocal critic was the vice president of the United States. Oh, by the way, Congressman Gallagher, um, his, he had a personal stake in kind of limiting some of these investigations himself because his name came up on a wiretap, Congressman Gallagher's name, of a gangster named Joe Vicarelli. And within a year, Congressman Gallagher was in jail serving time for non payment oh. of income tax. So okay. Funny how uh, that worked out. Yeah. Similarly, Skinner was attacked and Beyond Freedom and Dignity was attacked by Nixon's Vice President Spiro Agnew. Agnew had said the book advanced, quote, conditioning people to conform to a bizarre view of what society should be like, mm -hmm. a utopia mm -hmm. to be achieved through what the author called a technology of behavior. Dr. Skinner holds, in effect, that man has neither soul nor intellect and is completely a creature of his environment. Well, that's true, but and if you can control a man's environment, he the Skinner theorizes, you can control his actions and his thoughts. Mm -hmm. Skinner attacks the very precepts on which our society is based, Spiro Agnew, the vice president, said. It's kind of scary if the vice president said that about me or something bad about me. I'd be a little concerned. Mm -hmm. But Skinner goes on to write in his autobiography, notwithstanding his high-sounding rebuke, Agnew soon resigned the vice presidency after pleading no contest to charges that he had taken payoffs from building contractors shortly right. before coming vice president. Right. So two crooks. Uh, yeah. The, the, some of these critics of uh, Skinner in high places, they, uh, they had some of their own uh, skeletons in the closet. It looks like. Uh, and Skinner wrote further in his autobiography that he, he was giving thought one day to Beyond Freedom and Dignity, and he said he was really proud of that book. It was a terrific mm -hmm. book, and, and very few people are granted the opportunity to write a book like that. Mm -hmm. He was proud of it, and uh, he became sort of tearful thinking about it, he said. Mm -hmm. So- mm -hmm. um, Affected him, affected yeah, him in that way. It, it mm -hmm. sure did, and um, I understand it. So yeah. it was very interesting to me to read the file and um, get a real interesting uh, perspective on the history of not just Skinner, but the way the world was. And, you know, I'm old enough, of course, to have lived through that. And, um, and I just, uh, I hope we, we remain aware that threats like that could always materialize. And, you know, we, we have a very divided nation right now, it seems like. So we, we have to be vigilant, I believe. It, it is one of the takeaways, um, not just the effect this could have had on BF Scanner or the field or other fields, 
but the reputation of of the FBI of law enforcement that it it could be turned into a political in- instrument. Uh, and uh, it's, so it's a, you know, we would think of it, okay, we have the laws, we have the constitution, but those things can become a little bit iffy if the right pressures are applied, if the right contingencies are in place. And then the very things that are supposed to protect us then um, kind of can become uh, uh, dangerous depending on which uh, a political view they think you hold or where you're at or what's going on in the world. Yeah, and we've seen it in the past uh, four or five years, actually, and without getting into political aspects of it, we have learned in the past two, three years that Donald Trump tended to think of the Department of Justice, where the FBI is housed, as his personal set of lawyers. And, um, you know, he fired uh, his first attorney general, Jeff Sessions, the Alabama fellow, because Sessions, among other reasons, would not uh, take sides and uh, try to get rid of uh, Robert Mueller, who was investigating the Russia collusion allegations and all that. And then uh, when William Barr became the attorney general, uh, William Barr is saying now, in fact, he's been saying this and even this week that um, Donald Trump attempted to essentially corrupt the Department of Justice in numerous ways by um, pressuring it to end its investigations of him and so on and so forth, uh, January 6th and all that. So it can happen um, that the, the high, what I think of as the highest law enforcement agency in the nation, the FBI, which is chartered to do work in America. Uh, The CIA is the other one, but it's charter does not permit it to work inside the country. It can only do uh, international work. That's probably a a no whole other story right there. Possibly so. So, um, you know, we always have to be quite vigilant, I think. So, well, part part of the so the the response to the Mar-a-Lago, however you say that, the former President Trump's uh, home in Florida, the response is that the FBI is being used now uh, as a political instrument, doing a a raid, doing a warrant search, or whatever, and it's for political reasons. But once uh, you know, I. I believe in the law and government, but once something has a reputation of being used uh, one way, it can it can be accused of that down the road. People can say, well, they, they could respond and say, that's not what we're for. We, we follow orders. We follow warrants. Yeah, what about this? You know, you're, it's not just the Constitution, the government. It's partly the reputation of the institution ends up mattering long term. I want to go on record right now. Back behind me, that's my desk back there with that lamp. I do not have any classified documents there, none. And uh, you can come over anytime and look in there, and you won't find them. Well, I say once once you invite them in, you know, uh, <laughs> you know they'll be in there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, they're they're kind of like making their case. It's just uh, uh, these institutions. Uh, I don't think they realize what. Uh, it, it can be used as a defense now. So, oh, you're just doing this for political reasons now. You know, that's a uh, and that's a, that's it's kind of a lesson. It's a lesson for all institutions to keep their integrity solid throughout, because Absolutely. down the road you don't know what you know. You're going to depend on that reputation and integrity to be able to do your mission. And we know whether it's a government institution or a relationship with another person, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. In business, industry, you name it, trust builds very slowly. Mm-hmm. And it can be broken down very quickly. Mm-hmm. And then it's very difficult to build it back again. So mm-hmm. you're right. Okay. Joe, th- these are always very interesting. It, it's a, I learned you. actually a lot of things uh, from each of these interviews. So, you know, 
you I know you've written more you've written all kinds of stuff so uh, I'll have to bring you back again and uh, you know uh, we'll go over something uh, other new and interesting thing uh, well thank you very much I certainly enjoyed it okay well once again uh, happy belated birthday <laughs> You're going to rub it in now that I turned oh, 75. No, no, is that it? No, I didn't say the year. So we <laughs> um, had, uh... that's perfectly, perfectly fine. All right. Thanks a lot. Good night, Joe. Take good care. All Bye. right. Bye bye.